Well, I'd like to read before I share what I want to share from the book of Mark chapter, uh, chapter 10. Mm. I'm reading because that's part of my testimony. If I don't read, then my testimony is incomplete. So let me read, and I'm reading for a reason, because I started reading when I was 22 years old, when God opened my eyes to read his book. So the first book I ever read was the Bible, uh, because I didn't have the privilege of going to school, and uh, I wondered why was I created, and who am I? Where am I going? I didn't have any direction. And so it was when I was 22 years old, God opened my eyes to read his book. So I'm reading to prove to you that I'm able to read. And so I'm reading from the book of Mark, chapter 10, from verse 46. Then they came to Jericho, as Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, we are leaving the city, a blind man, but me as that is the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard, that's the time factor, when he heard, the moment, the minute he heard, when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout. Now, this name Jesus does two things. First, you either love it or you hate it. Just two things. You either love this name or you hate it. And, and so that's what happened with this man when he heard that it was Jesus, something stirred up in his, in his heart. And then he says, have mercy on me. It's only a person who is right on the corner of his life. He is no way out. You cry for mercy. But when things are moving well, comfortable, everything is within reach, you don't cry for mercy. And you don't need mercy. And in the Western world, materialism has become your God. Because you have everything, so you don't need mercy. So here was this man right at the corner of his life, and he didn't know what to do next. He didn't know about tomorrow or an hour after the, well, from the minute he was leaving. It was dark. So he cried for mercy. But verse 48 says, many rebuked him. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Verse 49, Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called to the blind man, cheer up on your feet. He is calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet. And came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. Rabbi, the blind man said, I want to see. Go, said Jesus. Your faith has healed you. Immediately, that very moment, that very second, he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. What a story. I wish I could take you all, all of you there, and see what was happening, the drama of it. And we are not told how, what age this man was left by the roadside. We are not told. But uh, let's assume for many years he was by the roadside crying. Maybe he had 101 questions like me. Who am I? Where am I going? After death, what happens? And the moments when I was all by myself in the streets, these were the questions I asked and had no answers. Why was I created an African? Why was I created from a broken marriage? All these why, why, whys had no answers. And several times I wanted to commit suicide 
because I had no hope. I had no hope about life. And so I said, end it all. So this man was by the roadside, and he had about four problems. Problem number one, that he was blind. He couldn't see. And it's a picture of the people around the world who are spiritual blind. They've got eyes, but they, don't not, they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Spiritual blind. They cannot see the glory of God, the goodness of God. Completely blind. What they see is the material things around them. And so problem number two, as a blind person, he depended upon someone to take him from point A to point B. He was like one of those cars, those have been in Africa. You know, we have all these old cars. You know, when you drive these old cars, they've got too much smoke. Uh, you know, when you're driving, it's so much smoke behind you. And, uh, and, and when you stop, you have to stop on a sloppy place because they don't have a starter. And you need about 10 people to push you. And when they push you and then it goes, vroom, vroom, it goes. But when you stop on a flat place, you are stuck there forever. You have to look and choose for a sloppy place for you to go forward. And it's, 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 it's also a picture of people who are in the church. You know, they always want to be pushed all the time. They don't have the self-starter. They want a pastor to give them a good message on Sunday, but from Monday to Saturday, a flat battery. They want on Sunday again to be preached again, and they're on fire again, flamed again on Sunday, but from Monday to Saturday, a flat battery, and so on and so on. And the spiritual life doesn't grow up, doesn't go down, but they are on the same level for years and years, like the, in John chapter 5. The man at the pool of Bethsaida for 38 years. And when you are on one spot, you develop your own language. You develop your own language because you've been there, you are used on the same spot, sleeping on the same way and so on, expecting a miracle every day. And when you stay there for too long, you develop your own language. And you say, maybe tomorrow. Maybe tomorrow. And tomorrow comes, you say, maybe tomorrow. And when there are too many maybes, you finally say, maybe I was born to suffer like this. I was born to have migraine headaches. I was born to have hypertension. I was born to have diabetic and so on. And you claim those sickness to become your own sickness. And so... Because you have been too long on one spot. And when you stay on one spot, you become a good critic. You don't look at the blessings, but you look at faults. Because you have been in one place for too long. So your life is too smoky. You need to be pushed all the time. And thirdly, he was left by the roadside. Now, by the roadside, there's no participation. There's no involvement. There's no excitement. You sit there waiting to be blessed by somebody. And you don't have the blessings in yourself. And so that's what happened with this man by the roadside. He became a spectator. And how often in our churches were many, many spectators. There's no life. There's no involvement. There's no passion for God. There's no love for God. Because they are the, by the roadside, you become a spectator. You watch others when they are in the action, in the business. When a pastor calls for a prayer meeting, it's only three, four, five people who come to a prayer meeting. Whereas the rest of the church, spectators. And I remember preaching in Los Angeles. And after preaching in the evening, I was watching, wanted to watch uh, news. But in the process of playing with this gadget, which I didn't know, a remote control, and I was fi trying to figure out how it changes the channels, and I was like a little monkey 
didn't know what, you know, why there was no wire, but it was changing channels. But then suddenly I come to this channel where Joe Fraser and Muhammad Ali were boxing. And I laughed my lungs out. And I was crying in laughter. And people, maybe they heard me from the next rooms. But I was laughing. I wasn't laughing because of Joe Fraser and Muhammad Ali as they were boxing. No, that didn't you know, excite me. I was laughing at the spectators. Because each time as these guys were boxing, spectators were going like this, you know. You know, with their heads. And you see even when Manchester and Liverpool are playing, all the spectators, they, are, they hit the ball, but they are not in the pitch. You know, they, they are all imitating what is happening there. And spectators. And so often we have very good spectators in our churches. You know, there is no passion for God. They talk the language of Christ, but they don't live it. They don't move in, into it. So the world doesn't know that they are Christians. And so they, that's how I was. And, and so, fourthly, he was a beggar. He was a beggar. I remember before my mother dumped me in the streets, she used to ask me to hold my baby sister. She was only about two months old. And I would carry this baby sister and you cook, cook the baby porridge. And, uh, and I, I, she would say, feed the baby. But when my mother is gone out, what I would do is I would take the baby porridge and sprinkle it over her mouth and I would eat all of it myself uh, because I love the baby porridge. And she would cook some more and I would sprinkle it all over the face and I would eat all of it myself. And the baby was still hungry. And so many people have the word of God in their lips but nothing inside, nothing inside, very empty. And so I lived that type of life. And then in, this, in these verses, I love verse 49. Verse 49 is the best verse in the whole Bible. Many people like John 3.16. But John 3.16 works after this verse has taken place. Verse 49, it reads, Jesus stopped. Jesus stopped. That's the best verse for me. Jesus stopped. When Jesus stops, John 3.16 comes into action. And when Jesus stopped, I can visualize all the hosts of angels in heaven stopping all what they were doing. They say, hey, guys, Jesus has stopped. Why has he stopped? And you remember what Jesus said? There's so much rejoicing when one sinner comes to Christ. And I can visualize all the angels now getting ready to dance. You know, I thank God that angels don't dance the British way. Because angels dance the African way. Because we Africans know how to dance. You don't know how to dance. If you want to dance, come to Africa, I will teach you. And I know when we'll be going to heaven, Africans will be leading with the singing. Because we can clap hands without pianos and so on. The pianos are too heavy to carry. And so here were these angels ready to, joy, to rejoice. Why has Jesus stopped? When Jesus stopped, he said, call him, call the blind man. And if I were Peter, I would have said, Jesus, that's not on. That's awkward. You see that man is blind. You are asking the blind man to come to you. You should go to where the blind man is. But Jesus didn't do that. He asked the blind man to leave his place to Jesus. All what Jesus was doing here was to change his mindset. His mindset was, I can't. I can't. I can't. Negative, negative, negative all the time. And so often people don't receive the blessing of God because they live in the negative. I can't. It's impossible. It can't happen. 
And even if you want to pray for a sick person, already in his mind said, can it happen? They've already asked the question, can it happen? And so Jesus says, call him. And then when this blind man fumbles his way to Jesus, they come almost face to face, nose to nose, but Jesus doesn't heal him. And he does another awkward thing. He says, what do you want me to do for you? Now, if I were Peter, I'd have said, Jesus, no. Can't you see this man is blind? Just heal him quickly. But Jesus doesn't do that. He asked him a question because he's a gentleman. Jesus is God. A gentleman. And he will never intrude in your life. He will come into your life by your permission. You have to allow him to do what he wants to do in your life. Lord, take over my life. He will only come in your life by your permission. What do you want me to do for you? And this man says, Jesus, I want to receive my sight. And Jesus says, go. Your faith has healed you. And can you imagine his eyes popped up? He sees Jesus face to face. Not John, not Peter, but Jesus. Now, when you see Jesus, the Bible says here, he followed Jesus along the road. Now, look at him following this crowd of the band of 12 disciples. This man is right behind. He's not dancing the British way, but the African way. Smiling, dancing, jumping. Because he had seen Jesus. That's where my story comes in. Jesus met with me. You look at these hands. I don't know how many people I killed. I'm coming from this background where I didn't want to do all these things. I wanted to be like any other child. Growing up, loved, being kissed by my mother, by my father. But I didn't all have all that love. I don't know what is parental love. Love from my mother, from my father. I wish I had such kind of love. But as I, my, I know my story comes from where my father came from Malawi, went to Zimbabwe to look for employment. And my mother, the parents of my mother came from Zambia to Zimbabwe also to look for employment. But when the parents of my, uh, my mother saw my father, that he was a good church elder in the good Presbyterian church, they, saw, they thought he was a good man. So they forced my mother to marry my father. In those days, they used to have these arranged marriages. And she was only 13 years old. And she was crying, I want to to get an education. But the parents didn't look at the side of education. They looked at marriage. Our daughter must be looked after by a good man. But the problem was my mother was only 13 years old. To marry a man was about 50 years old. So the gap between a 13-year-old girl and a 50-year-old man was just too wide. And she was crying at the wedding day. And they told her, please don't cry because you are embarrassing us. But the more they told her not to cry, she cried some more. And then later on, the wedding went through. But after one week of their married life, my mother ran away from her, her husband, going back to her parents. And when they saw her, said, why have you come home? Said, mom, I don't love that man. He's too old for me. But the elders of the village took her back to her husband. And within a few days, she would run away. And they would take her back to her husband. So she was going to and fro. And eventually, the child inside her was wondering, why do we have to go this way and that way, this way and that way? And that child was me. And I was born when my mother was only 14 years old. She almost died. And I almost died and survived with hospital uh, help. Then later on, two years later, she had another child who was my brother. And years later, I had another child who was our sister. And she had about three kids before she was even 20. And then one day when I was about four years old, I 
to the shock of my life, I overheard my father and mother shouting in the bedroom. And upon hearing what they were saying, I heard my name being mentioned over and over and over. And my father was accusing my mother that this boy Stephen is not my son. He doesn't resemble me. And I was shocked for the first time, who is actually my father. And I would hear, overhear my mother saying that I've never slept with any man. He's your son. He's your son. If you ever say these words again, I'll kill myself. And I was wondering what is killing myself. As a four-year-old boy, I didn't know what was committing suicide. And then these fights went on and on. And eventually my father walked out of the house and left my mother alone. And, and for a few days she was desperate. And she said to herself, I cannot take my kids to my parents who put me in this mess. So she took us downtown in Harare. And then she says, Steve, hold your baby sister. I want to go to the public toilet. And I was carrying my little baby sister. And she went to the public toilet. And I waited. One hour became two hours. Became three hours. My mother was gone. And I didn't know what to do with the little baby. And I was crying because, not because my mother was gone. Yes, she was gone. But I, I had been holding the baby for too long. My, my, my arms were painful. I wanted to stretch my arms, but I was afraid to drop the child. And so I was in, in pain, and eventually the police came to my rescue, and they said, where's your mom? I said, she has gone to the toilet. And they went to look in the toilet. She was nowhere, nowhere to be seen. So they had to rush with my baby sister to the hospital because she was shivering terribly. And my brother and I were taken to the orphanage. And that was another separation between the two brothers and their only sister, which was going to take 49 years before we ever saw our sister again. And so went to the orphanage. And upon arrival at the orphanage, I was greeted by some big boys who were bullying, you know, and they beat me on my nose and I was bleeding. And the teachers found me, you know, crying. They said, young boy, why are you crying? I said, one of the boys has beaten me up. They said, tell me their names. I said, I don't know their names. I've just arrived. I said, young boy, are you playing games with me? And I thought he was joking. And he gets me and he ties my hands around the wall and he takes off my shorts and he whips me 12 times. And as I was screaming, wetting myself, thinking, Maybe I'll have merciful ears, but all my cry went to deaf ears. And when he finished whipping me about 12 times, and I could see him breathing, that he was just doing with all his strength. And I could hardly even sit down. And the following day, these boys would beat me up again, and I would be on the receiving end, both, both sides. I would be whipped again. And so much that I could even hardly sleep on my back. And the fourth day, I told myself, Stephen, be a man. Now, here is a four or four, five-year-old boy telling yourself, be a man. And when he got me this day, he tied my hands on the pole. And he started whipping me 12 times. But this day was different. I never cried. He was used every time on the first whip. I would scream and wet myself. But this day I didn't cry. I didn't wet myself. I just stood there taking it all. Just stood there. And as he finished, he was doing, undoing the ropes. He didn't see any tears in my eyes. And he said, young boy, you think you are tough? And he felt like defeated. So he ties me again. And gives me another 12, but not one drop of a tear. He didn't realize that when a boy doesn't cry, you have actually created a dangerous boy. Because tears is like medicine. It is always health to cry. It is unhealth not to cry. And it is dangerous not to cry. When you need to cry, you must cry. Because those tears are like medicine. But if you hold back those tears... 
they become poison in your life. Even the best counselor can never reach in your heart, in your heart because those tears become dangerous. And I've seen many people who should have cried, maybe at the funeral, or maybe they were hating, they didn't cry, they held back those tears. Right now, they still carry the old baggage of the past, which influences their present lives today because of the, the tears they didn't bring out. And so that's why I'm writing my second book, The Power to Change Your Negative Past. The power to change your negative past. That you need to deal with your past. If you don't deal with your past, you are in danger. And so, after he finished beating me up, uh, you know, he yeah, loosened the ropes. I, I started walking out of the orphanage. And as I was opening the gate, he said, young boy, if you touch that gate, I'll kill you. And I went on, didn't look at him, and walked out and left that orphanage leaving my brother at the orphanage and then another separation which was going to take many years before we met again and then i went right through to the forest to the bush trying to find ways as a small boy how do i kill myself life is meaningless who am i why was i created to suffer and i said as a young boy when i go to the bush if you are there god I hate you. I hate you. And here's a young boy shouting at God, I hate you. And because life was just impossible. And then there in the forest, there was an old road, a burned road, and I started staying under that bridge that became my permanent home. And I used to separate the sand, sleep in the hollow, and cover myself with the sand. During the day, I would go in the white suburbs to scavenge in the garbage bins. And was there, I was picking up these, you know, junk food in the garbage bins. So I grew up feeding myself from these garbage bins. And when I was 10 years old, I met other street boys who were like me, had no parents. And we started making friends. And that became like my family. And with these, these boys, my the group started growing from 15, 20, and 30. And so we formed this, uh, this group, and we named it the Black Shadows. That's why my book is called Out of the Black Shadows. Now, if you met with this gang, the Black Shadows of 12-year-old boys, your life was in danger. There was no one who met with my gang in the streets and walked away alive. That's how dangerous that gang was. Because I wanted to express those tears um, with my gun and with my knife. And I said to my gang, if I ever see you warning someone who makes you angry, I will kill you myself. If someone hates you, give him two things, a knife or a bullet. Just get over with it as fast as you can. And so I was even unpredictable with my friends. They didn't know what I would do next and so on. And when I was 13 years old, I remember because we had been breaking in many homes and breaking in many cars, stealing car radios. And if I had nothing to do to express that anger out, I would go to the parking area where white people parked their brand new cars. I would take the screwdriver on a brand new car, scratch it right around. And, and puncture all the car, you know, the, the tires and so on. And I would feel like I was eased up inside, and that I was revenging, and so, as it were. And then life went on. As the age of 13, one young boy looked at me from a wealth family, well-educated boy, and he looked at me because my hair was long, was uh, dirty, full of lice, and I was stinking. I had never had a bath for many months. My, my smell was horrible. And I had never worn shoes. And he looked at me at my pants, which had two holes at the back. And he said, look at your pants. I had got two holes and so on. And I stood there. I never said one word. But this boy didn't realize that I was coming from the orphanage with those tears 
compressed in my heart. And he made a very big mistake that when he came forward, he pushed my forehead backwards. And I pulled out my knife and went over him several times. As he fell down, I knelt down, continued stabbing him out. And in my mind, I visualized my mother and my father. As I was stabbing this boy, like I was stabbing my own father and mother. Because I had vowed that the day I will see my mother, I will kill her. For bringing me in this world, I didn't make any application for her to bring me in this world. And the day I will see my father, I will kill him. Because they brought me in this world to suffer. So as I was stabbing this boy, he was on the receiving end, like a substitute of my father and mother. And then as I was walking away, walking over his body, and my friend said, Steve, are you an animal? And I said, you say one word, I'll kill you. And I walked away as if I'd done nothing. And it was for the beginning of so many series of my life. And then when I was 16, joined all the freedom struggle in Zimbabwe, throwing petrol bombs and so on. It was in the bush area where we had to shout, there's no God, there's no God. Communism is the best ideology. Communism is good. Communism is good. So I embraced the Marxist ideology and rejected any, anything to do about God. Any white man from Britain was an imperialist. Anyone from, from, uh, from America was an imperialist. And so kill every imperialist. When you kill a white man, then you have done justice. So I vowed that I'll only greet a white man. First you kill him, then greet him later. Never talk to a white man who is alive. Kill him first, then greet him later. So that was my vow. And so the hatred against white people, the hatred against God, the church, and every church was a target to blow it up with bombs. And so one day I happened to, um, when I was 20 years old, I happened to be assigned with a, a bomb which was going to be planted at a, at a bank. I said, all white people go to that bank. And so as a time bomb on Monday morning, quarter past eight, it has to go off. So I said, yes, that's very good. If I can cure as many whites as possible, I'll be excited. So as we were going towards that bank in the evening, about six-ish, then we saw a big tent by the roadside. <clears throat> by the roadside, and we, we thought it was a circus. I said, guys, let's go and see what is happening there in the circus. But when we got there, only to hear that they were preaching about Jesus, and the tent was from South Africa, and anything from South Africa was a taboo because of the apartheid system they had. So I said, guys, there's nothing good which can come from South Africa. Before we get to the bank, let's surround this big tent. And in twos, at 7 o'clock on the dot, I'll blow the whistle, throw the bombs at one time. I want every person inside to die. If one person is going to escape, I'll give you a gift of a bullet in your head. They say, okay, Steve, we'll do that. Then as they were about to go around the tent, one of my friends had uh, a stolen watch. He said, Steve, it's about five minutes to seven. I said, well, since I've got five minutes, let's go inside and look at the people who are going to kill in a minute or so. So we went and entered the entrance, and we set the last bench near the entrance. And we all, 16 boys there, and with our AK-47 folded in the paper, in the paper bags, the, you know, guns and so on, and, and bombs, and we said, well, guys, let's look at them as they will be dying in a few minutes. And so, suddenly, they started singing choruses. And my gang at the back, we started singing on top of our voices, but out of tune to disturb the meeting. And one of the preachers came and touched my shoulder, said, please, boys, you are making noise. And I pulled out my knife. I said, preacher, if you ever touch me, I'll kill you right now. Never touch me. And one lady jumped to this preacher and said, please, walk away from these boys that are dangerous. Please walk away quickly. And he walked away. 
and I, I started tossing my knife. But my gang all looked at me. They were like shocked. For the first time, they saw heard me warning someone. Because that was not my character. If I had pulled out my knife, I would, have, I would have used it. If I pulled out my gun, I would have shot that person. But they were shocked that I warned this man. Then suddenly in front of us, they invited a beautiful girl from South Africa to share her testimony how Jesus came into her life. And that put me completely off balance because she was gorgeous. She was very pretty. And I was confused as to why such a pretty girl becoming a Christian. So in my understanding, Christianity was for the old, old grannies who are about to die. Because they were useless in this world, so they needed to be Christians. Or maybe ugly girls who didn't have boyfriends, and so, so Christianity was for them. But here was a pretty girl. How can a pretty girl become a Christian? But the more she shared the testimony, it was like a face was shining with the glory of God. She had something which I couldn't put my finger on, but she had something which attracted me. But I didn't want to be converted by, by a woman because I was afraid of my friends. They would think I was a chicken. And so she invited another black evangelist from Johannesburg. And this man from Johannesburg, an African evangelist, stood up and read two verses. He read Romans 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus. And he read another scripture 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus, that though he was rich, he became poor, that through his poverty you may be rich in Christ. And then he kept quiet after reading the two scriptures, and he held his Bible like this and looked at us. And for what seemed like three, four minutes, he never said one word. He just looked with his sharp eyes. And I said, now, What's going on? And then this preacher started crying, and he was weeping, and he never said one word, and was just crying. I said, now, what's going on? The first confusion was a pretty girl, but now the second confusion is a preacher reading the Bible. He doesn't preach. He's starting by crying. Why is he crying? Then he wanted to say something like his voice was choked, and then he said, I'm crying because the Spirit of God is telling my spirit that so many people seated here tonight are going to die. I said, uh oh, guys, you hear what that preacher is saying? Get ready. So I took one of my revolvers from the back. I tucked here in front, and we started making our bombs in the paper bags ready. I said, guys, get ready. You hear what that preacher is saying? And so he starts preaching, but he said, tonight I'm going to preach about God's transaction, that you give him with your right hand your life. And he'll give you with his right hand, you know, his forgiveness, eternal life, joy, peace. That's what is all in one package. But you give him your, your life, you have to do this transaction, exchange with Jesus. But he demonstrated this transaction by being rejected when he was in his mother's womb. And I said in my mind, yes, I can identify with that Jesus who was rejected, and here I am, rejected. He was born in a manger. All the hotels were full. All homes were full. But Jesus, the animals, gave Jesus way to be born. I said, yes, I can identify with that Jesus. Here I am, sleeping under a bridge. And I said, Jesus had a borrowed donkey. He had a borrowed house for his last supper. He had a borrowed cross. He had a borrowed grave that you, through his resurrection, you may have life. And I said, indeed, that's the Jesus I can identify with. But as he talked about this wonderful Jesus, that's the Jesus I wanted. But he, then he turned his message to Romans 6, verse 23, when he spoke about the judgment. That's the part I didn't like. Because as he spoke about the judgment of God, he would point his finger. And I didn't like that finger all the time. He would speak about sin, about murder, drugs. You name it, I was sniffing glue, marijuana, you name it, or LSD. 
and as I was a drug, ed, a drug addict at the age of 11. But as he preached that night, I didn't like that finger. And so the next thing, I pulled out my knife. I wanted to stab my own friend in the same gang. I said, I'll kill you. How can you go and tell the preacher about my sins? And he took out his knife and said, I'll also kill you. You told him about mine too. And so we started arguing and then we sat down with our knives like this. But it was that finger which made me restless. So the next thing, when he would do like this, I would duck down behind someone's back and I would sit up. When the finger came out, duck down. So I was going up and down, up and down. But little did I know that you can never hide from the finger of God. And that night, under the deep conviction of the Holy Spirit, I broke down in tears. And right at the back there, a young boy, dirty, smelling, stinking, stood up, picked up my guns, my AK-47 and my bombs, and I started walking forward. And he was still preaching. He didn't stop preaching. And he was still preaching. I knelt at his feet and held his legs, crying like this, but me as, Jesus, son of David, have mercy. And as I was crying, one of the preachers wanted to take me away from his legs. He said, please leave him alone. You are disturbing me. Let him cry there. And I went on crying as he was preaching the word of God with such authority in tears. But the next thing as he was winding up his, me his message, a different gang, a different gang altogether came to the tent and threw the bombs into the tent and blew up that tent. Many, many people died that night, just as the preacher had said. And many cars outside were set ablaze. Every car was on fire. And the fire brigade was coming to put out the fire, and, and the tent was bent up to the top. You could see stars and people fleeing for their lives, falling over benches and so on, and many dead bodies around. And three of my gang members were killed that night when that bomb exploded. And then, as I was still holding on the legs of that preacher, this group of evangelists, they started singing that chorus, there's power, there's power in the precious blood of the Lamb. And then after a while, an hour or so, it was quiet, and I happened to be the only boy out of 3,000 people who were there. One boy remained behind, dirty, stinking, uneducated. And they wondered why, out of all those 3,000 people, just this dirty boy coming forward. Maybe they were discouraged when they looked at me. And then I remember the preacher sitting down to counsel me. He had to take his handkerchief because of my dirty body. And I wondered, he, even this preacher, using his handkerchief to talk to me. And I was crying. And then he said, young boy, why have you remained behind? I said, can you Jesus save a sinner like me? He said, yes. God loves you. The moment he says God loves you, I pulled out my gun, pointed on his forehead. I said, preacher, I'll kill you right now. Never tell me about God. I'll kill you. Don't tell me about God. Tell me I want you a Jesus. You have been preaching about tonight. So with me, I didn't understand that God and Jesus were, you know, was one person. To me, I thought God was different, who let me down, who left my mother, who allowed my mother to, to, to reject me, to throw me away. If he was there, why did he leave me to suffer? And then I wanted this Jesus who was preached, the preacher about that night. Then this preacher started crying. He said, young boy, you asked me a question. I said, no, I don't want this God. I want your Jesus who have been preaching about. How can you tell me that God loves me? My mother rejected me. I'm 20 years old. I don't know how to write, even my own name. I don't know how to read. I've never been in school. I sleep under a bridge. I feed from the garbage bins. You tell me that God loves me. I want your Jesus. And this man started crying. And then said, young boy, let me tell you. A young girl in Soweto in Johannesburg, was coming from school. 14-year-old girl, she took a shortcut, and a man with a knife got hold of her and forced her in the forest and raped her several times, and she was left for dead. And eventually, a few hours later, she revived. And months later, she was pregnant. 
and she did love this child out of rape. And nine months later, she gave birth. She didn't tell her stepmother. She went in a public toilet and gave birth and took that child, forced the child in the toilet, still with the umbilical cord, and she ran away. Another woman was going to help herself in the toilet, found this little baby in the toilet, and pulled out that child, felt the heartbeat was still there, rushed to the hospital, and the child survived. And he said, that child is me. And I saw his life and my life were identical. And I've said, if Jesus could save this man, he can save me too. He said, young boy, I was given the name in Sutu, Muhanwe, which means rejected one. I grew up being called rejected, rejected one. Rejected until 1947. When I accepted Jesus, I was renamed Shadrach Moses. And that's who I am now. And I said, if Jesus could save me, he can save you too. So he read me Psalms 27, verse 10. Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. It was because of this scripture that night, I accepted Jesus. I said, Jesus, come into my life. Have mess upon me. Take away all my evil things. And that night, Jesus came into my life. And I felt like a heavy load of sin rolled away. And the miracle happened that night. It was the power of drugs left me. And I had a very bad language. Every second word was a terrible language. God cleansed my mouth that night. And I went under my bridge. I knelt down. I said, God, now you have saved me. I'm your child. What must I do? And the Spirit of God came upon me with, with such power. And I said, God, it's enough. It is enough. And the voice behind me says, Stephen, Stephen, stand up. And I turned around to look at the voice speaking to me. I couldn't see anybody. And that word says, Stephen, I will open your eyes. And I will send you to many nations you do not know. And I slept. And that was the best sleep for the first time in my life. And when I got all up in the morning, I looked at the same place, the same trees. And I started laughing, you know, rejoicing. I said, God... Why couldn't I see this beauty of trees before? So I knelt down under one tree and I hugged one tree. I said, Lord Jesus, if you are only here, this is how I was going to hug you, to tell you how much I love you. And the Spirit of God came again with such power. I don't know what language I was talking. And I didn't know about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but something was happening there. And the voice again says, Stephen, stand up. And I looked around. I couldn't see anybody. I said, take these weapons. Go and surrender yourself to the police. I said, God, they are going to hang me. I said, I will be with you. And I went and got into the bus. And when I got in the bus and looked at the old people, miserable and happy, I said, Man, these people don't know what has happened to me. So I stood up in the bus. I said, ladies and gentlemen, last night Jesus came into my heart. I'm a child of God. I was bubbling with joy. And one man was tough. He said, you shut up. We don't preach on Mondays. He pushed me out of the bus. And I started dusting myself. I went to the next bus. I said, I'll tell the drivers. I was going to the next bus. The driver, last night Jesus came into my heart. I'm a child of God. My sins are forgiven. I was bubbling with joy. Many people started crying in the bus. And one woman said, young boy, what must we do? I said, well, I don't know. You know, I was just less than 24 hours in the Lord. And I didn't know how to lead someone. But when we got downtown, I forced all the people to kneel down. and said, do you mean while people are walking to and fro? I said, yes, I just did it yesterday. Just kneel down. So I forced them to kneel down. They were crying and repenting. And out of those seven people, three are full-time pastors serving the Lord. One them before I was even 24 hours in the Lord. They are still serving the Lord. And I've never stopped ever since sharing my testimony wherever I am. If I am above the clouds, the unfortunate person is the one who sits next to me. I tell him about Jesus. We are stuck together and you are stuck. And I raise up my voice for others also to hear. And so Many people have come to Christ above the clouds. Led people, many people to Christ above the clouds. And I go through the immigration 
When they stamp my passport, I share my testimony with immigration officers. And I share with the police. And everywhere I go, I fill up my car. I share the testimony about Jesus. And I, I enjoy talking about him, what he's done for me. And as I close, and I went to the police, and after eight hours of interrogation, they said, well, if you don't call this a miracle, we don't know what to call it. If your Jesus has forgiven you, we forgive you too. And what a wonderful Savior. This Bible says, if the Son of Man shall set you free, you shall be free indeed. And I was free at last. And as I was walking away, the police officer gave me money, said, don't buy a knife, go and buy yourself a Bible. So I bought my first Bible from the police officer, which I didn't know how to read, but I enjoyed flipping the pages only. But I said, God, the day I learned to read this book, I will read it and read it and read it. And I was going into the forest, sometimes for two weeks, no water, no food, crying to God, praying and fasting, battling with God. God, please just open my eyes to read your book. If I can read your book, I'll never compromise preaching this word. I'll be faithful to your word. And after two years, when I was 22 years old, God opened my eyes. And that's why tonight I um, was reading to you what this living God can do. If you have never seen a miracle, here I am. A walking miracle of the grace of God. Nothing less, nothing more, but just God, God, God. That's what Christ can do. And so I thank God that I was battling with my past. As I said, I'm writing my second book, The Power to Change Your Negative Past. So as I close in these few seconds, I went around sharing my story. And, and uh, seven months later, a white missionary from Britain, and I, that's why I love you British people, from Britain by the name Patrick Johnston, the man who wrote the book Operation World, that man took me and started teaching me. And today I'm able to write because of that white missionary. 15 years he spent in Africa, he invested on one boy, and that one boy is me. And that he produced from that one boy who has traveled around the whole world. And I've been almost every part of the earth preaching about Jesus preached to presidents, prime ministers, universities, but I've never been to school. God has given me 10 languages which I speak fluently as I go across the world proclaiming that Jesus is Lord, Jesus is the Savior. And I had to trust God that God I didn't want to get married because women talk too much. <laughs> no, women don't talk too much. Uh, it was not because women talked to me, but I was afraid of myself. I didn't want to get married to any woman uh, and then experience what my father and mother experienced. And I said, God, if you are going to give me the wife, give me three things. Number one, that you give me that real Calvary love to that woman that literally every day she will hear from me, I love you, I love you. 365 days and I thank God that God gave me that love for my wife and uh, secondly that she will not only hear that I love her but secondly she will see with her eyes what she hears she will see and thirdly she will feel it every day she will feel loved and feel loved and so after seven years of trusting God God gave me the wife I have today and what a blessing and what a saint God gave me. A glorious woman, highly educated, married me who never went to school. But by the grace of God, Calvary has been the center of our home, our marriage. And I thank God that God has blessed me with all my children who love the Lord. And so some of them play in the band in the church and they are passionate for Jesus. And I thank God that God has blessed me to who I am. As I went around in Zimbabwe, 
in the football stadium as I was preaching to over 40,000 people. I made an appeal. People came forward. After 38 years of preaching, as people came forward, I was praying for the sick and for those who came to accept Jesus. And, and one woman jumped up, completely healed. I'm healed, I'm healed. And she comes and said, I want to receive this Jesus. And I knelt down with that lady. And she accepted Jesus as a personal savior. I said, God bless you. Come again tomorrow. He said, no. Before I leave, I've got one more problem. I said, what is your problem? I'm tired. Can you share that problem tomorrow? He said, no, I have to share with you tonight. I said, what is your problem? He said, from the way you have shared your story, you must be my son. And that was my own mother. The boy she dumped in the streets. That boy grew up. 38 years later, the boy became an evangelist. That boy led her into the kingdom of heaven. And what a glorious ministry to find my own mother. It was difficult to call her mother, but God had to deal with me because he had prepared me to do, to give me that inner healing, to be able to forgive my mother. And later on, years later, preached in Malawi and found my father, led him to Jesus and took him in my home. And uh, after being with him for almost six years, he lay on my lap and he said, my son, thank you very much for, for finding me and for forgiving me. I rejected you and you find me. I said, my dad, that's the example of Jesus. That's what Jesus did for you and me. We rejected him, but he found us, died on the cross. And so we prayed together and praised God. And then he said, can I pray for you? And then he prayed for me. And when he said, amen, he didn't open his eyes. He went to be with the Lord at 104. So I had promised him that you are dying at 104, and I think I'll go beyond that because I'm busy preaching. But I thank God that God brought me, brought all my family, found my brother, and later on found my sister. And last year, oh no, two years later, uh, uh, 05, 05, my sister and my brother in 49 years met for the first time. What a glorious gospel we preach. That this is what Jesus can do. Maybe I'm talking to someone tonight. You are still hurting. You are still carrying the past. It wasn't easy for me to forgive my mother. It wasn't easy. But God had to give me that inner healing. To be able to forgive my mother from the heart. Maybe you are abused. We don't know. Maybe you are hurting from the first marriage. You are in the second marriage. You are carrying the junk of the first marriage into the second. I don't know what it is. Maybe you are here, you have never had a personal relationship with Jesus. If God did that to me, he can do it to you tonight. You can say, Jesus, I want to have this encounter with you tonight. If you helped Stephen, I've got everything. You have got everything here in this country. You don't have a reason to reject Jesus. And so you say, God, help me. If Stephen found you, let me find you tonight. You can have that personal encounter with Jesus. Maybe you are still hurting. You want something of the past to, to get rid of that past. You want God to give you that power to change your negative past. And you cannot change your history like me. I cannot change my history of my life, but I can change the impact of my past, not to impact the present. So often, the past impacts you. So maybe you are here, you say, God, if you touch Stephen Lungu, you can touch me too. And I want to pray for you tonight. And I thank God that out of 3,000 people, only one boy came forward that night. And if I had not come forward, I don't think I would have been here today. And how many millions of people have come to Jesus through my preaching, over the radio, television, and through my book. Every day I receive hundreds of letters of people who have been touched by my own book through Amazon.com and so on. Hundreds of people come to Jesus almost every week from that boy who was rejected but found by Jesus. Maybe there's someone here. 
God wants to change this nation through you. And you say, God, here is my life. Touch me. Maybe you have been on this, by the roadside for too long. You have been by the roadside for too long. You have been a spectator for too long. You have no passion for God, no excitement for God. You say, God, touch my life tonight. And God is going to touch you. Shall we pray? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Maybe you are that person tonight. You say, Lord, I want to have that personal encounter with you. And I know as British people, sometimes it's embarrassing to say yes. And I want to ask you as British people, I did that to Jesus. And I want you to say to Jesus, God, here is my life. I'm struggling. Oh, I've been on the roadside. I'm born again, but I've been on the roadside for too long. I've been on one level of my Christian walk for too long. I'm not going downwards. I'm not going upwards. I've been on the same level for too long. God, touch me tonight. And you want Jesus to touch you. I want you to stand up where you are. And I want to pray for you. And this is a very hard decision you have to make. And I don't compromise and I say to God, I will not compromise. And you have to do it for Jesus. Thank you for those who are standing. Please stand up. You say, God, I've been on one level for too long. Or maybe I want to have a personal encounter with you. Lord, I want you to touch me. Maybe I want inner healing in my heart. I'm still carrying the junk of the past. Father, I want you tonight. Just stand up where you are. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you. Take that boldness. My brother, come forward. I want you to pray. Take that boldness. Say, say, Lord, maybe you have never had a personal encounter with Jesus in your life. You say, God, I want a young people tonight. You young people, I want you to surrender your lives to God. And so much is at stake with the young people, our young people. So young people living, you know, surrendering their lives to the devil. Many young people going even sexual active at the early age of their lives, outside marriage. You say, God, here's my life. I want you to touch me. Stand up where you are. Say, God, here's my life. It's a transaction. It's a transaction. You give him, he will give you. So stand up where you are. Say, God, here's my life. while people are bad then if you're standing then let's just pray and make this prayer your own prayer pray this in your own hearts Father God I thank you I thank you that you are interested in me I thank you that you love me I thank you that you are willing to send Jesus to die for me Lord God, I'm sorry for, for all my sin, for all the times that, that I turn away from you, for all that I've done that's offended you. Please forgive me. I give you my life, my sin. <clears throat> I give you all that I am. Please come and fill me, change me, live within me, and make me into the person that you want me to be. And may you turn my life around so that now I live for you and you alone. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please do have a seat. Can I say, as you're, you don't have to rush away, do stick around. There'll be people at the front. Stephen's here. Joshua's here. Dennis is here. Others in the church. I'll be here. If you want to come and talk to someone, come and pray with us, come and, come and share, then, then do. Don't, don't feel you have to rush away at all. We'd love to chat. We'd love to help you out more. We've got some literature. We'd love to give it to you. If you're here tonight and that's the first time you've ever wanted to commit your life to Christ, come, come and speak to us and we've got some literature that will really help you uh, as you start out uh, as, as God has touched your life tonight. Do come and take that. Uh, do get the books. They're out there. 
They're five pounds each, I've been told, not four pounds ninety. I'm sorry about that. Do order the DVD. And why not, if you've enjoyed tonight, hands up who's enjoyed tonight. If you've enjoyed tonight, why not get the DVD and share it with someone else so that they can hear that too. Someone maybe that you think, I wish they had come. Well, why don't you take it to them? Um, this book, I don't take one penny. I dedicated it to Africa. You buy this book, it will help me reach out with the gospel to Africa. Thank you, Stephen. So you don't need to rush away. You can stay. The bar's open so you can get a drink. Thank you again for coming. And I think on behalf of all of us, I want to say thank you again to Stephen for, for making time in his schedule to come down uh, through the rush hour and everything else. We've really benefited uh, from hearing. And I'm sure uh, many lives, many of our lives have been touched tonight. So can we say thank you again as we finish?